So hello everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Global Network webinars. My name is Alexander Loschke and I will moderating this webinar today together with my colleagues Sean Lovell and Panya Yu. Um, today we have with us Francesca Perucci, Yahanara Said, and Deidre Apple from Open Data Watch, who will present on advancing national data systems with the Gender Data Compass. As a compass helps travelers orient themselves, the Gender Data Compass is a guide for national statistical offices, other government agencies, development practitioners, and donors seeking to build robust, inclusive, and effective gender data systems. The results of the first round of Gender Data Compass reveal a stark reality. Ma many countries face significant challenges in producing the necessary gender indicators for informed policy making and monitoring uh, progress towards equitable and sustainable development. Despite these challenges, the Gender Data Compass offers a roadmap of recommendations and solutions to overcome them. And our webinar today will present the Gender Data Compass and how countries can use it to improve and strengthen their own gender data systems. Let me now introduce our speakers. So we have with us our dear old friend Francesca, who should be well known to many of you. She is the Director of Policy and Partnership at Open Data Watch. Francesca is an expert in the field of development data and global data initiatives. She brings many decades of experience at the United Nations, most recently as our Assistant Director of the UN Statistics Division, and led the development of the Sustainable Development Goals Indicators. Yahana is responsible for the planning and coordination of work program activities at Open Data Watch. <clears throat> Prior to joining Open Data Watch, she was an associate director at A EAB and education and technology firm. Yahanara has a master in international economics and international relations from John Hopkins University and a BA in economics from Smith College. <coughs> Deidre is a communications professional with a strong focus and advocacy in the realm of sustainable development. She ensures Open Data Watch's impact in shaping global policy agendas. She holds a Master of Global Policy Studies from the University of Texas at Austin. So before we start, let me just say a few practical things. So we will first hear the presentation before we will have the Q&A session at the end. As always, feel free to write comments and questions into the meeting chat at any time. During the Q&A session, we encourage you to ask your question yourself just to make everything a little bit more interactive. Um, but yeah, please write your questions already into the meeting chat uh, whenever you want. And also, as always, this Global Network webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the Global Network of Data Officers and Statisticians at yammer.com slash unstats. So, and we invite you then to continue the discussions on the Global Network after the webinar. So now over uh, to Francesca, please go ahead. The floor is all yours. Thank you, Alex, and, and, and thank you for giving us this opportunity. It's a really a great pleasure to be here with my former UNSD colleagues and to have the opportunity to introduce our work at uh, Open Data Watch, and in particular, uh, the, the new tool, the Gender Data Compass. Uh, as you say, you know, we look very much forward to continuing the discussion after this and hear you know, where you're connecting from and what uh, your role is in your organization. And if you have if you have ideas on how we can further support your work from uh, from where we, we are at Open Data Watch with our various uh, tools uh, and initiatives. So um, I'd like to go through 
the agenda first a little bit, just to say a few words about what we will introduce today. Uh, first, of course, uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about, uh, after the welcome and introductions, we'll talk about the, our work and in particular um, a little bit explaining what our main product, what makes us perhaps uh, more known uh, in the beginning was the open data inventory known as Odin. Uh, and then we'll introduce the gender data compass, as I said, more in details, and then give a, a live demonstration of how the, the tool works. And then in the end, uh, I think the most important se session will be on uh, uh, listening to your questions and addressing your views, your points. So uh, on the next slide, uh, as I said, before we dig into the gender data compass, uh, I'd like to say a few words about who we are and what we do. Uh, we are an international uh, nonprofit organization based here in the US um, that works at the intersection of open data and, and national statistics. Uh, we work through different uh, uh, areas, uh, monitoring, research, capacity development, advoc advocacy effort, efforts, and we support uh, national statistical systems as they improve their data systems, uh, increase, increasing uh, the use, the impact, and the overall value of data. So, but what are our areas of focus? Well, I mentioned monitoring. That's number one. Uh, through our monitoring work, we track data openness in particular and coverage, as I said, through Odin, the Open Data Inventory, uh, which this year is in uh, its seventh round. Hard to believe time went so fast since when Open Data Watch was established, and we celebrate 10 years this year. Um, we identify also gender data gaps, for instance, through the Bridging, uh, bridging the Gap uh, series. Uh, and now, more recently, we assess and understand gender data systems through the Gender Data Compass. But we also focus a lot of our work on uh, capacity development. We provide technical assistance uh, and capacity development support. For instance, recently we launched a new initiative with the colleagues at the UN Statistics, Statistics Division on uh, specifically on capacity development on open data to make uh, to, uh, to support countries in implementing open data principles and practices and, and make um, overall data more impactful. And uh, we manage and support peer exchange and knowledge sharing through the Gender Data Network. And we also provide policy advice to facilitate and encourage uh, prioritization of data systems and use of data. Uh, for instance, uh, we do um, we support uh, smarter gender data financing. Uh, we work on uh, building strong data governance and stewardship practices, uh, including within uh, intergovernmental processes, standard setting processes, such as at the UN Statistical Commission. And we identify solution to close gender data gaps. And, and here I also would like to mention our work on citizen data, uh, in particular to close data gaps, uh, to make data systems more inclusive. Uh, and we're part of a collaborative on citizen generated data. Uh, and also mention our recent work on data for intersectionality, also very, very important to increase the inclusiveness of data systems and to allow for better data analysis to address uh, intersectionalities. So, uh, as I mentioned, our flagship product is the Open Data Inventory, uh, or ODIN, uh, which highlights critical data gaps around the world. Uh, and ODIN is also now a component of an official SDG indicator, indicator 1718.1, for those of you who are familiar with our numbering systems, system of the indicators, uh, together with two modules of the SPI, the Statistical Performance Index by the World Bank. So it's, a, it's a, an index that is very widely used around the world. So if you look at the map, uh, here we summarize the overall score for data availability and openness as assessed by Odin uh, in countries around the world. Uh, you can see that many countries are performing well. You see the green, uh, but there is still a long way in many other countries to ensure that data that are produced by the National Statistical Office are relevant, are accessible, 
are usable, especially in, in some of the low and middle income uh, countries. So now with a similar approach to what we have uh, taken when we created the established Odin, we developed the gender data compass. And, and the compass, as, as um, Alex said in the beginning, is really a tool to, to offer an understanding of where countries stand in terms of coverage and openness of gender data. And it's really from a user's perspective, providing uh, an assessment, a, a very objective assessment of what areas need to be prioritized, where investments is needed, and, and to what extent you know, the, the work needs to be done uh, to, to achieve better gender data systems in each country. In each country. <clears throat> so I know we have a very diverse audience. So for instance, for, you, for those of you who are in UN country teams or resident coordinator offices, your data officers, uh, you know, this, this is, can be seen as a very good tool to uh, support, you know, the, your work in supporting governments to, to improve their national data systems and to guide development of efforts. Uh, um, for those of you who are in national statistical offices, again, this is a tool to advocate internally for strengthening the production and dissemination of gender statistics, to understand how your office is doing in the regional context or in comparison with other parts of the world, and again, understanding you know, how to prioritize uh, your, your plans, your, your, your um, development internally. So, uh, I think this is enough from me. I'd like to turn uh, now to to our, my colleague Jay, who will uh, give you the details of uh, of the tool, and then uh, we'll follow with uh, a live demonstration uh, uh, of the tool. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much, Francesca. I think you did a really good job of setting us up today on sort of what the Gender Data Compass is and sort of why we created it. So you can see sort of a slight overview of what we really hope to achieve with the Gender Data Compass. It's a new tool to understand and improve gender data systems globally, and it can answer many questions, some of which you can see here on the screen. Can a country's funding landscape and national capacity support transformative change? Are country-level data accessible and open to all? Do countries have policies and laws to produce and disseminate gender data? And what official data are available to understand and tackle issues of gender equality? And the answers to all of these questions and so many more can really serve as that practical guide that Alex was talking about earlier to offer directions to NSOs and their partners on how to, uh, on their path towards gender equality. So what does the Gender Data Compass entail? So it assesses in its first round 185 countries globally. It includes 53 quantitative indicators across 10 data categories. And by data categories, here I'm talking about things like living standards, digital connectivity, environment, and things like that. We also have and analyze 17 qualitative indicators um, to help us understand the enabling environment for gender data. And all of this really comes together in over 100,000 data points that all help us understand the current state of gender data systems and identify areas for improvement. So what are the components or points of our gender data system? So unlike a traditional compass, we have five points here, and I'll go through them from left to right um, just to give you an overview of what they entail. So for availability, here we're trying to answer the question, what gender data are missing? Um, then when it comes to openness, we're thinking about of the data that are available, are they accessible? For foundations, we're thinking about what legal policy and coordination frameworks exist in countries to support gender data. Under capacity, we're thinking about what is a country's technical and statistical capacity to manage their gender data system? And of course, none of this would be possible without funding. So for financing, we're thinking about and looking at the national and international funding for data. So over the next few slides, I'll go into each of these five elements mm -hmm. in a little bit more detail to give you um, more detail about what exactly we're looking at. So starting with availability and openness, as Francesca mentioned, this is really here to help us understand a user's experience of NSO's databases and how someone like you or me 
would be able to what data we'd be able to find if we went to an NSO's data a database and how would we be able to use it? So under data availability, we're looking at the extent to which gender data are available in national government databases. Our assessments really review a host of things. So they're looking at whether data are disaggregated by sex, available across multiple years so that we can compare over time if they include geographic and other important disaggregations. And by that, I mean, are they available at the district, provincial level, and also if it's disaggregated by things like age, disability status, race and ethnicity, mm -hmm. etc. For openness, we're measuring the barriers to accessing and using available gender data. So here are investment assessments review why the data are available in machine readable and non-proprietary formats. So think about a spreadsheet instead of a PDF. If it's selectable by users, so can I pick and choose what kind of data I'm looking at and how to download it? And is it accompanied by adequate metadata and open terms of use? So as a user, do I know what each of these indicators um, is actually looking at, where this data is coming from, when it was collected, and do I know how I can use it? Um, so for the enabling environment, it really helps us understand the ecosystem for gender data um, and how we can support it more broadly. So here on the foundation side, we're trying to understand how NSOs are empowered to collect and produce gender data. And to do that, we review statistical laws, national statistical plans, any gender equality plans or other plans from gender relevant ministries. For capacity, we're looking at census and survey repositories, the completeness of administrative data systems, the development of information, communications, and technology to really evaluate the overall infrastructure that exists to produce and disseminate gender data. And then finally, for financing, we're looking at external official development assistance to countries for gender data and national budgeting where available for gender data. And this is really to help us identify the resources for the and the prioritizations of gender data in national plans. So what does the gender data compass show us? Um, unfortunately, the news isn't good. And if you recall, when we showed you the map on um, Odin, there was a lot more green than this slide is showing us. Um, so what we're seeing here is the state of global gender data systems is quite poor. And this, what the slide is showing you is a combination of the availability and openness scores for a country. And this is really here to help us understand the extent to which policymakers and citizens and other users in these 185 countries can publicly access and use gender data that is available on um, national databases. So what we can see is that in most countries, gender data are not readily available. And when they are available, they aren't fully open. So an example would be the mean of uh, the global mean for the combination availability and openness is 30.7 out of 100. And more than half of the countries fall below this mean. So that really indicates that we have a long way to go in making sure that gender data are both available and open. Next, we can look at what the scores look like across each of the elements of the gender data compass. So we see from all five of these points that there are opportunities for improvement. So like I said on availability, we're seeing that um, gender data are not readily available and not a single country scores above 60 uh, for data availability um, when it comes to gender data. On openness, again, there's lots of room to improve. The average openness for gender indicators is about 34.7, which is below the average for openness for other non-gender data categories as we've looked at in Odin, which is about 53. So that's really demonstrating that um, gender data are less open than non-gender data, minus some maybe tech, my methodological differences in how we calculate it, but overall the message is that gender data is not as open and available as non-gender data. When it comes to foundations, we see that 
there is there are a lot of countries that fall in this sort of medium category, but only 8% are in that high um, capacity area. And then again, for capacity, we see that there's a wider range in terms of how countries are scoring. But from our research, there are crucial components such as administrative data that are lacking and need to be strengthened. And then finally, for financing, which might not be a surprise for a lot of folks on the line, but two thirds of the countries that we looked at are rated as low when it comes to official development assistance and when it comes to thinking about whether national budgets are allocating funding to gender data. But I think what's most interesting is this 17% up here um, where we could not really assess the countries for financing because they didn't have national budgets that were available publicly or those national budgets didn't have any relevant information and details. So that really shows that we need even more transparency when it comes to the finance side of things. So I know I've gone into a lot of detail about what the gender data compass entails and some of the results, but who is the gender data compass for? But I think Francesca did a really good job of really summarizing this for us, which is everybody. We think um, national statistical offices can use it to identify critical gender data gaps and opportunities for improvement. International groups can use a gender data compass to identify uh, can target where their help is most needed. Donors can use it for investment and project planning. Policymakers in country can explore mm -hmm. sort of areas where their interventions are needed most. And of course, advocates can track and progress any highlight and progress and highlight any issues. So I know we've talked about the gender data compass in the abstract. So I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Deirdre, who will then be able to give us um, a more detailed overview the website and its use cases. So over to you, Deirdre. Wonderful, thanks Jay. Um, and thanks all for, for joining us today. It's, it's great to be here. I will now uh, walk us through the gender data compass through the perspective of a selected user. As Jay mentioned, we have a handful of targeted users in mind, but in the interest of time, we have decided to take on the perspective of a data officer recently assigned to a UN resident coordinator office in the country of Ghana. This individual is keen on understanding the gender data landscape of their new country to effectively navigate their responsibilities. They've turned to the Gender Data Compass as a comprehensive resource to gain insights into the current state of gender data. By leveraging this information, they aim to enhance their day-to-day -day decision making and contribute to gender-related initiatives in Ghana. So like everyone else, this data officer's first stop is likely to be the homepage of the Gender Data Compass website. Scrolling down, they would get a glimpse of the scope of our research by reading the introduction. And moving down even further, they come to their first visualization that shows how country scores are distributed within each of the five points of the gender data compass that Jay had shared earlier. From this, the data officer can see that globally, there's a lot of work to be done to strengthen gender data systems across each of these areas. Specifically, they can see that while a handful of countries score high in gender data openness, most countries still s struggle significantly. And to strengthen overall gender data systems, they can see that the issue of financing is likely to be a particular challenge in many countries. But of course, for all of us working in the data space, we're very aware of the challenges that exist which is why the Gender Data Compass also provides opportunities and recommendations that support countries across all points, which we will dive into shortly. Scrolling further on the homepage, they then can see our global map that offers a more detailed look at the availability and openness of gender data across countries such as Ghana. At a glance, the colors show how countries are doing across the different regions. Here, a data officer can get a quick snapshot of their country by selecting it from the list above or simply clicking it on the map. For Ghana, they can see their average of the availability and openness score, which is what determines the overall rank, as well as a breakdown of the scores for each of these two categories. And they can get their first hint of how Ghana compares to other countries, both globally and regionally. 
More information can be found on the rankings tab at the top of the website. And while we won't go into that today, we encourage you to explore and dive deeper later. So each of the 185 countries that we assess has a country profile. The profiles provide an in-depth look at how a given country is doing across each of the points of the gender data compass. From here, we select Ghana and we go to the specific country profile page that you're seeing now. Once there, the data officer would again see a brief overview of their combined availability and openness scores, and then again their global and regional ranks. These ranks are always of great interest to countries. Uh, from our extensive experience with the open data inventory, we found countries like to compare how they're doing with their neighbors, and the desire to increase their rank from year to year does motivate some countries to make improvements. Moving further down on the country profile, but staying on the summary tab, the data officer can see a summary score of each of the five points of the gender data compass. Our data officer can quickly see that despite how well Ghana is doing with its institutional foundations and capacity levels, data openness is an area that requires attention. And scrolling down a bit further, we see a set of recommendations. The data officer can review these to get an initial idea of where improvements are needed most based on our research. For Ghana, in addition to encouraging the country to publish more gender data to close specific gaps, we also highlight other ways such as improving the openness of their data, which would include publishing in more open formats, all under an open license, allowing anyone to freely download and use their data. And lastly on this page, the data officer can see that the Open Data Watch team is fully available to answer questions, seek feedback, and work directly with um, users. Here we encourage them to get in touch with us, which numerous have done already. It's our aim that each of the tabs of the country profile can shed light and dive deeper into the many ways that a country could improve their gender data systems. So scrolling back up, you can see what I mean. The data officer now moves to the availability tab. In our summary recommendations, we encourage Ghana to make more data available, and here they can see exactly what categories we have in mind for this and which ones have the least amount of gender data. As we see the, the um, visualization here, environment and digital connectivity are the areas where there is most need to improve. This points the data officer in a general direction, but scrolling down, they can start to pinpoint the availability gaps more precisely. The vis this visualization shows a breakdown of Ghana's availability scores across each of the four elements that we assess. But the data officer will likely want to know more about the specific categories so that they can develop a set of priorities that they can recommend and perhaps even include in future data strategies. To get this information, they can select any of the categories from this drop down menu that you're seeing, and it shows how the data perform across each of these elements. So let's stay with the environment and select that one as it is the one that needs most improvement. The list of indicators here shows exactly what data sets we're talking about in terms of gender relevant environment indicators. And from the bar chart, the data officer can see that very few of these indicators have sex disaggregated data. And of those that do, none provide further disaggregations beyond sex, nothing substantial in the last 10 years, and none broken down by the different regions of Ghana. Closing gaps in data availability is crucial not only to improving Ghana's country scores, but also to making vital information available to policymakers and citizens alike. And while we recognize filling data gaps can be a long-term process, there are also lower hanging fruit to improve the gender data ecosystem in areas such as open data. At this stage, the data officer scrolls back up to the top to see what Ghana's results of openness are. As we see by the score, data openness is where Ghana has the greatest area for improvement. These results may look like the availability tab, but they're telling a different story. The data officer can see which categories are the least open, which determines how accessible the data are to users. Again, environment and digital connectivity are still the lowest scoring, while we can see that living conditions are coming in at the highest. 
Let's take a closer look at how this breaks down. There won't be much to see with the lowest scoring categories, so let's see how things look for a different category that policymakers and gender advocates are currently very interested in. Environment, um, I'm sorry, employment and time use. Within this area, the data officer can see that they need to start publishing data in more open formats, moving from PDFs to spreadsheets, for example. However, there's also a major gap with data license. This means that despite all the efforts to publish the data, users aren't allowed to freely use and reuse the data for their own purposes. This might be something that they emphasize when they report to their boss or others within their department. And this opportunity to adjust policies has gotten them thinking about the broader policy and governance in place or the institutional foundations to support gender data in a country. And so they go up to the foundations tab. Across the next three tabs, we start to look at more qualitative indicators of a country's support for gender data. Oh, excuse me. Um, so Ghana we see here is part of only 8% of countries that have a high level for foundations, and the visualizations below shows why this is the case. The first question the data officer can answer here is, does their statistical law support the production of gender data and in what way? In Ghana, though the statistics law in doesn't include a mandate for gender statistics, it does include a coordination mechanism for producing statistics overall. Scrolling down, we can see that there are other questions that a data officer can explore around gender data foundations, such as whether the national strategy for the development of statistics includes gender data. And heading back up, the data officer continues to investigate the state of capacity within their country. Now on the capacity tab, the data officer can explore the structures and strengths that Ghana needs to produce and use gender statistics effectively. What our data officer might want to know is what specific course of action they can recommend to improve availability of gender data. And so one big question they may have is, where are the survey gaps that may be contributing to insufficient gender data in certain areas? This country profile shows that in Ghana, time use surveys and labor force surveys should be completed with more frequency. Scrolling down, it also shows insight into the capacity of administrative systems, education, health, civil registration, and even the capacity of country staff. So while producing more gender data through increased surveys is an area where Ghana could focus its efforts, the data officer knows that finding the funding to make such improvements can be a challenge. And this leads them over to the last tab. The financing tab covers the questions of domestic and international funding for gender data. The data officer wants to know how much money has been allocated for gender data within Ghana's budget for official statistics, as we know any course of action that's recommended needs to be feasible within a country's financial context. Scrolling down, the score here shows and looks at whether gender data is included explicitly in the national budget. And in this case, we can see that the budget does in fact include allocations for gender data, as well as how much. While this doesn't say anything about whether there will be enough to fully fund certain ambitions for improving gender statistics within Ghana and more nuance on demand is needed, it provides a solid starting point for advancing further on these questions and other tools like the gender data channel of the Clearinghouse for Financing Development can take that conversation even further. Each of these tabs have given the data officer a lot to work with, but it'd be very helpful for them to have the original data of these visualizations so they can use the, and create their own reports and presentations. This is when they turn to the data download page. On this page, they will be able to download all the detailed scored information that we present on any country profile. For this, they would click scores at the top, select the country, and specify the structure and format of the data. They will find an even greater wealth of information when they select data set information. Not only does the gender data compass share scores, it also shares the data sets that we found along with the information that we use to calculate such scores. 
For example, for each indicator, we show what data set we found with its disaggregations and years. We show the formats of the data that are available, the metadata that are available, and also the terms of use. And we even provide a link to detailed navigation instructions for the user to be able to find the data themselves. This will be extremely helpful to the data officer as they work to pinpoint specific data sets that need to be updated and improved. And it is our hope that it will be helpful for many other users from data journalists to policymakers and citizens alike. And lastly, for those who really want to dive deep, we make the methodology guide available as well. And so as I begin to wrap up, I hope I have shown that through this user example, we have only scratched the surface of what's available on the gender data compass. For example, while a data officer may be initially interested in drawn to their own country profile, the report we have produced for the gender data compass provides a global landscape and picture of gender data around the world. We encourage you to read through it along with continuing to explore the rest of the website at another time, or perhaps even we can discuss further features um, during our discussion as well. So with that, uh, we'll close the live demo portion. Thanks all for your attention and back to uh, you, Jay. Thanks. <clears throat> Sorry, thanks, Deirdre. Um, I believe, Francesca, you'll be doing this last slide. Yeah, thank you, Jay. Uh, happy to cover this. Uh, just to say a few words about where we go next. So uh, our plans are, of course, to continue to update the gender data compass periodically so that we can not only monitor progress uh, over time, but also continue to offer countries a tool that an updated tool that they can use in their in their work in their work uh, we'll engage with countries uh, to promote the use of the tool and and to promote uh, the improvement of gender data systems and when i say countries I think we want to engage also with users of the tools so that we can continue to improve and update the tool to make it more effective for, for your work, especially, you know, as, as we are talking today to colleagues who work in UN country teams or in national statistical offices, those who deal with this uh, in their everyday work. Uh, and we'll highlight other disaggregations, uh, so such as age, ethnicity, disability status to facilitate uh, inclusivity and building uh, inclusive data systems. Uh, we'll also, uh, in terms of our analytical priorities, we'll develop uh, nuanced recommendations uh, to guide country improvements plans. So looking at the, the overall status of or in, in terms of coverage and openness to highlight where improvements are needed. Uh, and and how, what can be done, uh, linking you know the different indicators, uh, explore deeper foundational issues to provide better insights about the enabling environment for gender data, um, and then we'll conduct on-demand analysis to understand the intersection of gender and, and different development sectors. Uh, in terms of advocacy uh, priorities. We'll uh, encourage development projects to use the tool uh, so that it can be helpful to set goals and targets to close gender data gaps. And again, uh, making this tool really available to uh, colleagues working in countries to, to um, en engaging in, in capacity development efforts to improve gender data systems. So um, we we'll also include uh, use cases uh, and, and examples so that uh, we can all understand how to use the tools more effectively and then create advocacy campaigns around this uh, with the targeted issue uh, briefs to elevate the need for open and inclusive data systems. So these are the different ways, you know, the tools can continue to improve and be used extensively and be re really impactful and, and uh, be helpful in, in your work. So with that, let me go turn it back to Alex. Uh, Alex, thank you so much again. Back to you. Sorry, I was muted, of course. Um, so thanks again to all three of you. Really a great presentation. Very interesting insights in the availability of uh, gender data around the world. 
And yeah, unfortunately, we can see uh, the current state is not yet that good. Um, I'm opening, well, trying to uh, allow microphones and cameras now for everyone so people can ask questions. This should be uh, possible now. And let me, uh, looking at the chat, I saw a question. Uh, maybe we can start with that one from uh, Shiam. Uh, Shiam, if you would like to come in, that would be great. Uh, in that case, please just unmute yourself. If you want, you can switch the camera on and uh, you can ask your question yourself. If that is not possible for you, I can also read the question. Um, so, uh, and before I do that, just for everyone, please, um, if you have a question, uh, raise your hand or type it into the meeting chat. But uh, if you can ask the question yourself, it would be nice. So, uh, Shiam was asking, so the term gender disaggregation has a political connection, uh, connotation, sorry, in a number of countries where disaggregation by sex is accepted. So how do you handle such situations? Are the two terms interchangeable? So maybe you can say a few words about that. Thanks. Alex, you want me to take that? Yeah, uh, and then happy, you know, for the other colleagues also to, to come in. Uh, I think as Jay showed in one of the slides, if I'm not mistaken, uh, she had that in the indicators that we consider, uh, we look at data disaggregated by sex. So I think we have to be careful uh, when we talk about gender and sex uh, and, and, and really be uh, explicit in, in, in explaining, you know, that the assessment is made on, uh, on the basis of those data indicators that are disaggregated by sex. And, and I get Shiam's point, it's super important. Uh, indeed, uh, very few countries today include other categories in their data collection uh, tools, in their data collection programs. Uh, I think there is the, the Committee for Coordination of Statistical Activities. Some of the agencies have pulled together their efforts and they have compiled a list of categ categories that currently exist around the world. So I, I I'm hoping uh, UNSD colleagues uh, can make that available if this discussion continues on, on your uh, global network uh, um, uh, platform. Um, and it's very interesting to see, you know, what categories exist and, and the very limited extent of, of coverage. Having said all that, there are other efforts uh, through the work on intersectionality, through the work on citizen data to address the need to cover gender in a broader sense and our efforts uh, for instance in the citizen data um, work in the, within the collaborative uh, to work with lgbtqi groups uh, communities in countries and develop case studies on how data can be collected um, to address their needs and their circumstances including in countries where this is very sensitive and difficult so there will be ways to ensure you know protection and anonymization of data, et cetera. So there are efforts on the way. Uh, I don't know if my colleagues uh, want to add, if I miss it, missed anything here. Nope. OK. Um, then I see uh, Hadia. I hope I pronounced your name correctly, Hadia, from OCHA. So this is the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs has her hand up. So uh, Hadia, please, if you want to come in. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for this uh, great webinar. Uh, I think we need to have this uh, immunization of data sensitization quite regularly. We tend to forget that uh, we rely on this for any justification for interventions, be they humanitarian development or peace, and that they also need to link into each other and create that nexus connect uh, so that we can see whether um, sets of data used for um, development are uh, also uh, being used as a step up during humanitarian 
or um, vice versa. So my question, of course, um, I put it in uh, um, in in the, uh, in the text as well, is that I'm in extremely keen uh, for uh, understanding how do you develop into uh, tools to examine intersectionality at a grassroots communities level um, and um, also to be able to analyze the um, uh, the characteristics of and capacities and aspirations of women across uh, the range of being with disability being with uh, uh, different sexual uh, or gender identity or being with um, an indigenous uh, or ethnic uh, identity. So the tool A is very important and B, uh, an analysis framework that could help because often us gender people are not the best at crunching uh, data sets. So we do rely on our information management people and therefore we need to spell it out for them. How do you analyze uh, what kind of um, answers are we expecting from a question like this? What should the data look at? So it would be very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please go ahead. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm so happy this question was raised <laughs> because uh, intersectionality is really central to the work we're doing in Open Data Watch and, and, and more recently we've had a series of uh, uh, events where we outlined, you know, the work that needs to be done, what we're doing, and and just one recent event during the Commission on the Status of Women, the same issue was raised, the importance of creating the analytical framework. How do you pull together the different data sources? So it's not just a question of having the right data, which of course is, is key, but also a question of how you pull together these different data sources and, and you develop the analytical framework for the analysis of intersectionality. So uh, we, we looked at you know, what different data sources can be used. Uh, we are at the early stages, of course, so a lot more work uh, will have to be done. And um, but we already in the discussion, you know, of course, we are linking uh, this intersectionality agenda to the citizen data agenda because that's one of the most important data sources in the sense that they offer those data that are really collected to give a sense of the lived experiences of each individual. So it, you're not just one category, you're an individual who can be a woman, a person with disability, an indigenous group, you know, many different, many different uh, um, uh, uh, characteristics, let's say, for lack of a better word, uh, that that determine your, your experiences and your, your needs. So uh, that citizen data, so the two agendas are very linked. And but also we heard from our colleagues from the UN Statistics, Statistics Division at that same event at the CSW um, that there will be the possibility to link the work on intersectionality to the work of the data disaggregation uh, subgroup of the interagency and expert group on SDG indicators. So linking it to the uh, leaving no one behind agenda of the SDGs and looking in a more comprehensive way uh, to uh, at ways to bring together the data and create the analytical framework to allow for that, for those issues to emerge clearly and, and, and for the different data to be pulled together. And lastly, there is also a work stream within the Intersecretarial Working Group on House of Surveys to look at these aspects because the House of Surveys can also be used either as benchmark for uh, as benchmarking for citizen data or other data sources or as a tool themselves to be able to disaggregate to some extent although we all know you know there are challenges there when it comes to sample size etc but again you know all these different data sources can be pulled together uh, i don't know anything else that my colleagues want to add on data uh, on intersectionality i know some of other odw colleagues are also <laughs> in the audience back to you alex Thank you. Um, yeah, so I have also uh, seen another hand by uh, Jasmine Kaliva. Uh, Jasmine, if you want to come in, please do so and please maybe identify yourself where you're working. Thank you. Yeah, hello. Uh, so can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, OK, good. Yeah, so I'm a research associate for the Modern Energy Cooking Program services program at Loughborough University. And um, I'm currently developing a framework to monitor gender equality 
uh, in the modern energy cooking sector and um, uh, to improve it's the framework will be used also to improve the quality of gender statistics in this sector and we work with many countries in the global south and i want uh, and instead of using the female uh, um, desegregated data by sex um, I use the term woman and men, and uh, I felt that this might be more accepted in the global south. You know, it's very sensitive in, in many countries to start improving the quality of data. And this gives the opportunity for people who whoever identify themselves as women can respond to these surveys or identify themselves as men. Would this be accepted as a tool? Because I, I will start testing it with many countries uh, to improve the quality of gender statistics and to um, because mostly they uh, in this sector they focus only on time use while the framework that I used is looking at other aspects as well uh, so um, um, I would uh, I find that this is the, a good opportunity uh, to ask this question here because uh, I've been asking many people in you know, at the university and uh, other aspects. Uh, so it's also before testing the tool, I'd uh, like uh, to know your opinion about it. Thank you. Thank you, Jasmine. Yes. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. You're using the categories women and men in the, when you ask the question, correct? That's what you're saying? Uh, yes. Yes. Instead of male and female? Yes. And so, uh, I also developed indicators. So the indicator I refer to the percentage of women and men. I have a question there. Sorry if I just jump in. Um, in this case, Yasmin, what do you do with girls and boys? Because they are not integrated into the concept of, uh, at least in, in our work statistically, we, we will have different definitions for children, uh, boys and girls, and the cut age for women and men. Um, I used boys and girls as well, so. Um, okay. Yeah. And you have different age groups. I think this this requires a little bit of discussion yeah. that perhaps we can take offline. I, I don't know if we have enough time to cover all of this because there's been a long debate over the use of male, female, women and men, etc. Uh, perhaps happy to perhaps have a, a focus conversation on that on the platform, Alex, if you think that's something that, and also I'm sure colleagues at the UN Statistics Division who work more on uh, norm setting and, and, and guidance in this, in this area uh, from the uh, gender statistics program, they might want to get involved uh is that something uh, alex you might yeah help sure, us do? exactly yeah so jasmine uh you can uh so if you haven't done so yet you can join the global network of data officers and statisticians it's open to everyone so i'm also do some shameless uh, uh, advertisement right now. So I will put the link uh, into the meeting chat in a second, and then you can sign up preferably with your organizational email address. So if you have an email address from your university, that would be preferred so people know where you're working. And then uh, you can ask the question there and uh, Francesca and, and also uh, her team and also the colleagues maybe from our gender statistics section can follow up. Um, yeah, so this might require a little bit more interaction that we then what we can cover here in in our uh, short Q and A session. Um, I would I, I saw there there were a lot of comments in the meeting chat uh, back and forth about uh, 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 a lot of things. Um, there was one question which or one comment which I found interesting by Diana uh, who was just also commenting here uh, and she said so in some places having detailed data on gender could expose uh, vulnerable populations and this could be sensitive so I, I wanted to ask you maybe to turn this into a question uh, I wanted to ask you three if uh, you also assess um, the uh, whether the country in question also protects 
the data or sensitive groups uh, when they actually publish data on gender because it might be of course uh, be used for the good of uh, the country and humanity but it might also uh, backfire uh, uh, so maybe maybe you can comment on this I see Jay's nodding. Maybe you want. I don't want to take all the answer. That take the floor all the time. Yeah, whoever Jay, you wants. want to cover that. Um, no, I um, I would love to hear what you have to say, also, Francesca and Deirdre. But I was just thinking that in our that's a very important question. That's something that we consider in our intersectionality work as well. Sort of thinking about the do no harm principle and. Um, in our work, I don't think that the gender data compass specifically looks at those aspects right now, but I think that it's definitely a really important question that we should be thinking about as we continue to expand it to focus more on inclusive data systems more broadly. Um, but right now it's really data about data, but I could totally see something like privacy and security coming in on the enabling environment and the overall ecosystem side as well. So you've given us a really good idea for how we can continue to improve this moving forward. But I don't know, Francesca or Deirdre, if you have anything else to add. Yeah, no, thank you, Jay. Absolutely. I think what we're learning today from uh, from the reactions and the questions that are incredibly useful is that, you know, this whole idea of gender versus data by sex and what groups exactly we are looking at and how, how we assess the data availability and what the data are doing and the whole question of, you know, the sensitivities linked to this and uh, especially when it comes to groups that can face you know, discrimination, persecutions, etc. So this will help us, I think, refine also the language on how we introduce some of the concepts. And as we have indicators that deal, you know, with legal frameworks and other aspects, not just the data themselves, we also can look more into that, into those aspects, including, you know, data protection and security, etc. So very important and very useful. And, and thank you for, for those questions and those comments. Thank you. I saw also Sean had the hand up. Uh, Sean Lovell here, my colleague from UNSC, who is actually one of the co-moderators. Sean, if you want to come in. Hi, hi everyone. Sorry for this last minute. But I just wanted to say I've been thinking a lot about what's been said, and I, it, this issue of intersectionality seems uh, particularly relevant in the context of data gaps. When you think about, uh, oftentimes these data gaps seem to hint at uh, broader issues relating to human rights and the issue of women's empowerment uh, fundamentally that may reflect um, you know different starting points in the valuation for the relevance of this data so I, I just I, I think there's often an implicit understanding that we are you know at least in the United Nations system we we we're strong advocates of, of gender equality, and this is the basis for our determination to collect and disseminate uh, statistics based on, on gender and, and sex. Uh, so this is not a hidden agenda that we have. This is part of our, our core belief system, and I think this is something that isn't shared uh, in a lot of the countries that have strong data gaps. I mean, if you look at indices of human rights uh, or or uh, gender rights across the world, there are stark and arresting uh, variations that hint at at more fundamental issues. Uh, so, in the I'm just thinking about you know data can have this uh, cold analytic uh, perspective to it, but really fundamentally we're talking about. Uh, I, th I think these data gaps reflect deeper deeper uh, issues that are often better addressed directly um, in 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 a, in a conversation that touches on. On you know why are there you know missing data on critical women's issues uh, in in certain countries in the world? Well, it's probably because these issues aren't as valued in certain areas in certain countries as uh, they are in others. Uh, and this is not, I hope, a controversial statement. I think this is something that comes out of a lot of the human rights uh, data that that we have uh, globally. So I just I don't know if I'm dropping a nuclear uh, bomb in the middle of this, but I just <laughs> wanted to know if this is something that's talked about openly. This if this would be very interesting. Uh, to me, if I were if I were studying this, thanks, Sean. Yeah. Please, uh, whoever wants to to comment on this, uh, please go ahead. Well, I mean, I think he, he said it all, right, uh, Sean? Very, very important, and uh, in fact, that's where you see the big differences between. Uh, 
the coverage, you know, Odin, when you look at the map, you know, the greens you have in the Odin map and the total lack of green you have in the gender data compass map. And right, right. Uh, uh, that, that's, that says it. That says it all, right? Uh, even countries that have more advanced uh, data systems uh, are not necessarily advanced in terms of gender equality. And um, and I think, as you say, you know, data are a powerful tool, and and we need to highlight those differences. Incidentally, I also looked at some analysis that was done by another colleague uh, assessing the level of uh, the democracy in countries and Odin, the correlation with Odin and the gender compass. Again, there you see, you know, there are interesting uh, facts uh, emerging from that type of analysis and uh, how, you know, the strong messages you can you can get from looking at the gender data compass. So I hope that's one of the possible uses of the tool, highlighting those uh, uh, the need, the need to uh, increase overall policies and and uh, for achieving uh, gender equality in in countries. So very politic pol policy and politically relevant, I would say. But Jedra um, uh, J, your reaction. Thank you very much. Um, no, I was just going to jump in just quickly to say no. I think it's a very important point and perhaps a good, you know, closing one too, when we think about, um, you know, the politics behind this data, the power, the people, all all these other additional non, you know, technical terms with the, with the data. And, you know, one of the things that we found with the open data inventories, how well economic data scores round after round. You know that there's a big drive for collecting economic data, for the use of it, for policy, and um, there's the demand, and it's a continuous, what we call a virtuous cycle, and our aim is to then turn gender data into that same one where it's there is that demand and it's continuously being strengthened by buy-in and input and funding and investments and whatnot. So um, yeah, no, no, thanks, John, for bringing that up. Thanks. Uh, we are already a little bit over time, but uh, maybe uh, let me quickly round up with two more questions. Uh, maybe you can give a, a short answer. So there was one question by Daniel Eschelli, uh, also a colleague here from the UN Statistics Division, about country follow-up and validation process, uh, about the methodology and the way and the availability of the data. Um, I saw that Johanna had already answered that in the chat, but maybe you can say two sentences or three about this. And then I would like to add another question about, um, uh, uh, there was a question from Alberto Polo from UNFPA, so the United Nations uh, Population Fund, about recommendations on managing questions on gender issues in the census round, if you have, yeah. So those two things, and then we uh, wrap up. Hannah, um, go first, please. Yes. Sure, I'll I'll take that first question. And as you can see, my colleague Sheda has also added some more context. We really try to be as open as possible about the methodology that we use for this. So that's why the methodology guide is publicly available. We encourage countries to reach out to us. And we've already had countries demonstrate interest in using the Generator Compass results for technical assistance. Um, in the first round of, of the Generator Compass, we didn't include sort of a more formal country review process while countries can still reach out to us. But moving forward, as we do with our ODIN, um, the open data inventory, we will be incorporating a robust country review process. We'll be sharing sort of what we find with countries. They'll be able to reach back out to us, answer questions, um, ask us questions about the methodology. So this is really a way to make sure that what we're finding accurately represents sort of a user's experience of um, the country's databases. Um, so please feel free if you have other questions to reach out to us. We've shared the email in the chat. And just to add, perhaps, Alex, that the Odin, as uh, Jaysa has highlighted, uh, already has a very well-established process. And now that is also an SDG indicators, we are in full adherence with the guidelines uh, by the IAG SDGs and the um, CCSA that requires uh, they, they require a, a consultation process. 
for, for the indicator. So uh, as we move forward, uh, we'll continue to follow those those guidelines and ensure you know that we have a very extensive uh, consultation uh, process on on the work we do. That again, you know, the beauty of the work we do is that we do it from the user's perspective. So it's not a self-assessment of countries, but at the same time, we need to engage with countries on how we do it, the methodology, and for them to validate that what we assess is, is what they also uh, see. So it's, it's not a self-assessment, it's from the outside, but it offers uh, that validation process to ensure that the data are usable and, and have a, you know, uh, a real impact. Good, thanks. So um, maybe coming to this question by Alberto about uh, recommendations on managing questions on gender issues in the census round, uh, any maybe two sentences uh, comments on that and then we need to wrap up. <laughs> Thank you Alex. Again, you know, we work extensively in this area, especially now that we're engaging, we work on intersectionality and uh, we are part of the steering committee of the citizen data uh, collaborative, but the work on recommendations for census data collection uh, is done through the norm setting from the intergovernmental process, from the UN Statistics Division that is the secretariat to that. And so there are very extensive processes there. And it's not for me, although of course I know coming from UNSD, but it's not for me to say, and it's more for colleagues at the UN Statistics Division, uh, especially uh, in the demographic and social statistics uh, team that deal with those issues. And again, we're happy to contribute to the discussion and offer you know, case studies and offer, you know, the results of the work we do through these other work streams on how you can deal with gender and the different aspects and the different, and I've had actually a, a discussion recently with colleagues in the population division also who are dealing with this, uh, with these issues. And uh, so a lot of work to be done and happy to contribute. But again, the norm setting is not for us, it's for the intergovernmental process. Exactly. So, uh, but you you you're doing a really great job in pointing out basically where the gaps are and where things need to be done, and then other uh, parts of the UN or of the international uh, intergovernmental um, process need to deal with that. So, before we close, maybe I can uh, ask our colleagues online, the uh, participants. You can now maybe switch on your camera for a few seconds, uh, switch on your microphones, and then give our speakers a big round of applause for the amazing presentation they gave. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. So this is always my favorite part because with those webinars, we always see we don't see our participants, but they are there, right? So uh, it's just to show that there are actual faces behind the names in the in the list of people attending. So thanks everyone for joining today. Thanks again to our speakers and to Open Data Watch for this great presentation about the, the gaps in, in the field of gender data. And uh, yeah, please join us next time. Uh, next time is actually already next week, uh, where we have a colleague from UNICEF uh, speaking about benchmarking child-related SDGs. So uh, please join us next week and uh, see you then. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.